The zeitgeist movement defined, realizing a new train of thought. Essay 9, Market Efficiency versus Technical Efficiency. Quote, the synergetic aspect of industries doing ever more work with ever less investment of time and energy per each unit of performance has never been formally accounted as capital gain of land-situated society. The synergistic effectiveness of a world around integrated industrial process is inherently vastly greater than the confined synergistic effect of sovereignly operating separate systems. Ergo, only complete world desovereignization can permit the realization of an all humanity high standard support. End quote. R. Buckminster Fuller. Overview. Scientific development, while evolving in parallel with traditional economic development over the past 400 years or so, has still been largely ignored and seen as an externality to economic theory. The result has been a decoupling of the socioeconomic structure from the life support structure to which we are all tied and upon which we all depend. In most cases today, apart from certain technical assumptions with respect to how a system not based on market dynamics and the price mechanism could function, the most common argument in support of market capitalism is that it is a system of freedom or liberty. The extent to which this is true very much depends on one's interpretation, even though such generalized terms are often ubiquitous in the rhetoric of proponents of the model. It appears such notions are really reactions to prior attempts at alternative social systems in the past that generated power problems, like totalitarianism. Hence, ever since based on this fear, any model conceived outside of the capitalist framework is often impulsively relegated to the supposed historical tendency towards tyranny, and then dismissed. Be that as it may, this underlying gesture of freedom, whatever its implication in subjective use, has generated a neurosis or confusion with respect to what it means for a species such as ours to survive and prosper in the habitat, a habitat clearly governed by natural laws. What we find is that on the level of our habitat relationship, we are simply not free and to have an overarching value orientation of supposed freedom which is then applied toward how we should operate our global economy has become increasingly dangerous to human sustainability on the planet Earth. The difficulty of social relationships aside, humans, regardless of their traditional social customs, are strictly bound by the natural governing laws of the Earth, and to stray from alignment with these is to invariably inhibit our sustainability prosperity, and public health. It should be remembered that the core assumptions of our current socioeconomic system developed during periods with substantially less scientific awareness of both our habitat and ourselves. Many of the, neg of the negative consequences now common to modern societies simply didn't exist in the past, and it is now this clash of systems that is further destabilizing our world in many ways. It will be argued here that the integrity of any economic model is actually best measured by how well aligned it is with the known governing laws of nature. This natural law concept is not presented here as anything esoteric or metaphysical, but as fundamentally observable. While it is true that the laws of nature are constantly refined and altered in our understandings over time, certain causal realities have stood and continue to stand as definitively true. There is no debate that the human organism has specific needs for survival, such as the need for nutrition, water, and air. There is no debate with respect to the fundamental ecological processes that secure the environmental stability of our habitat that must go undisturbed in their symbiotic synergistic relationships. There is also no debate, as complex as it is, that the human psyche has, on average, basic predictable reactions when it comes to environmental stressors, and hence 
how reactions of violence, depression, abuse, and other detrimental behavioral issues can manifest as a result. This scientific, causal, or technical perspective of economic relationships reduces all relevant factors to a frame of reference and train of thought relating to our current understanding of the physical world and its natural, tangible dynamics. This logic takes the science of human study, hence again the shared nature of human needs and public health, and combines it with the proven rules of our habitat to which we are synergistically and symbiotically connected. Put together, a ground-up, rational model of economic operation can be generalized with very little need, in fact, for the centuries of traditionalized economic theory. This isn't to say those historical arguments do not possess value with respect to understanding cultural evolution but rather to say that if a truly scientific worldview is taken with respect to what works or doesn't work in the strategy of efficiency demanded by the chess game of human survival, there is very little need for such historical reference in abstraction. This view sits at the core of TZM's reformist logic and will be reviewed again in part three of this text. The bottom line is that these points of mere immutable scientific awareness are almost completely without recognition in the economic model dominant today. In fact, it will be argued that the two systems are not only decoupled, they are diametrically opposed in many ways, alluding to the reality that the competitive market economy is actually not fixable as a whole, and hence a new system based directly on these natural law realities needs to be constructed from the ground up. This essay will examine and contrast a series of economic considerations from both the perspective of the market system, market logic, and this noted mechanistic or technical logic. It will express how efficiency takes on two very different meanings in each perspective, arguing that market efficiency works only to be efficient with respect to itself, using man-made rule sets related mostly to classical economic dynamics that facilitate profit and growth, while technical efficiency, referencing the known laws of nature, seeks the most optimized manner of industrial unfolding possible to preserve the habitat, reduce waste, and ultimately ensure public health based on emerging scientific understandings. Cyclical Consumption and Economic Growth Market capitalism in basic operation can be generalized as an interaction between owners, laborers, and consumers. Consumer demand generates the need to produce via the owners, capitalists, who then employ laborers to perform the act of production. This cycle essentially originates with demand and hence the real engine of the market is the interest, ability, and act of everyone buying in the marketplace. All recessions, depressions, are a result on one level or another of loss of sales. Therefore, the most critical necessity for keeping people employed, and hence keeping the economy in a state of stability or growth, is constant cyclical consumption. Economic growth, which is generally defined as an increase in the capacity of an economy to produce goods and services compared from one period of time to another, is a constant interest of any national economy today, and consequently the global economy in general. Many macroeconomic tactics are often used during times of recession to facilitate more loans, production and consumption in order to keep an economy functioning at or ideally beyond its current level. The business cycle, a period of oscillating expansion and contraction, has long been recognized as a characteristic of the market economy due to the nature of market discipline or correction, which according to theorists is partly a natural ebb and flow of business successes and failures. In short, the rate, increase, or decrease of consumption is what generates the business cycle's periods of growth or contraction, 
with macroeconomic monetary regulation generally increasing and decreasing ease of liquidity, often via interest rates, in order to manage the expansions and contractions. While modern monetary macroeconomic policy is not the subject of this essay, it is worth pointing out here, as an aside, that mutual respect toward both the expansion and contraction periods of the business cycle has not existed historically. Periods of monetary expansion, often via cheaper credit, that usually correlate to periods of economic expansion, as more money is being put to use, are hailed by the citizenry as national successes for society, while all contractions are seen as policy failures. Therefore, there has always been an interest by the political establishments who want to look good and major influential market institutions protecting corporate profits to preserve periods of expansion for as long as possible and fight all forms of contraction. This perspective is natural to the value system inherent to capitalism, for pain is to be thwarted at all times, often in a short-sighted manner. No company willingly wants to downsize, nor does any political party willingly want to look bad, even though traditional economic theory tells us that these periods of contraction are natural and should be allowed. The result has been, in short, a constant increase in the money supply, i.e. purchasing power and capital, during times of recession with the end result being massive global debt, both public and private. The, rea the reality is that all money comes into existence through loans, and each of those loans is made with interest attached, where the loan must be paid back with the interest fee accrued, bank's profit, meaning that the very nature of money creation automatically entails a negative balance by default. There is always more debt in existence than there is money in circulation. So returning to the main point, with respect to the need for demand and consumption to keep the economy working, this process of exchange and general focus on growth is at the heart of the market's context of efficiency. It doesn't matter what is being produced or the effect on the state of human or earthly affairs. Those are all, again, externalities. As a concentrated example of this logic, the stock market, which itself is nothing more than the trading of money and its now numerous derivatives, generates enormous GDP and growth through resultant sales profit. Yet these acts arguably produce nothing of tangible life-supporting value. The stock market system and the now massively powerful financial institutions are completely auxiliary to the real producing economy. While many argue that these investment institutions facilitate businesses and jobs with their application of capital, this act is, once again, only systemically relevant in the current system, market efficiency, and utterly irrelevant in terms of real production, technical efficiency. In short, when it comes to market logic, the more turnover or sales, the better, and that is that, regardless if the item sold is credit, rocks, hope, or flapjacks. Any pollution, instances of waste, or other such detriments are again external. There is no consideration for the technical role of actual production processes, strategies for efficient distribution, design, applications, or the like. Such factors are assumed to culminate metaphysically in the best interest of the people and the habitat, simply because that is what the invisible hand of the market implies. Yet the growing, more with less, revolution in the industrial sciences has created a new reality, where the advancement of industrial technology has reversed the pattern of cumulative material effort with respect to efficiency. The logic that more labor, more energy, and more resources will produce proportionally more effective results has been challenged. In increasingly more circumstances, the reduction of energy, labor, and materials to accomplish certain tasks has been the outcome given our modern scientific technical applications. For instance, satellite-based communication today, while intellectually sophisticated, embodying a great deal of evolved knowledge, is in physical reality rather simple and resource efficient in comparison to the prior alternatives for communication, which in global application involved enormous amounts of cumbersome materials such as heavy copper wires, 
along with the difficult, often risky task of laying out such materials by human labor power. What is accomplished today with a set of generally small global satellites in orbit is truly amazing by comparison. This design revolution, which gets to the heart of what true economic technical efficiency means, stands in direct opposition to the cyclical consumption growth-based economic model. Again, the intention of the market system is to maintain or elevate rates of turnover, as this is what keeps people employed and increases employment and so-called growth. Hence, at its core, the market's entire premise of efficiency is based around tactics to accomplish this, and hence any force that works to reduce the need for labor or turnover is considered inefficient from the view of the market, even though it might be very efficient in terms of the true definition of economy itself, which means to conserve, reduce waste, and do more with less. If we hypothetically reduced our global society to a single small island with a respectively small population, with very limited technology as compared to today, finding that only X number of food survival items were possible in the natural regeneration of the land, would it be a good idea to employ an economic system that sought to increase the use and turnover of the island's resources as fast as possible for the sake of growth? Naturally, the ethic of strategic use and preservation would develop as an ethos in such a condition. The idea would be to reduce waste, not accelerate it, which again is what the true definition of economy means, to economize.